I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Tommy Johnson, Director of Membership and Events at the Portland Regional Chamber of Commerce. And on behalf of JPMorgan Chase, I'm pleased to kick off this timely conversation about data security in the COVID era. As people in com uh, communities across Maine and the globe are suffering from the devastating effects of COVID-19, JPMorgan Chase is supporting communities hit hardest by this public health crisis to help them get through the pandemic and to help them recover when it's over. To date, J.P. Morgan has made a $250 million global business and philanthropic commitment to help address the immediate and long-term economic and public health challenges related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Closer to home, the local commercial banking team compro comprised of Mike Griffin, Caitlin Crow, and Tanner Adams is also committed to helping main companies stay safe in today's evolving risk environment. The team is excited to share this dynamic conversation featuring Carolyn DeVar of J.P. Morgan Chase and Tony Perkins of Bernstein Schur, who I will introduce shortly. First, I'd like to recognize the partnership between J.P. Morgan Chase and the Chamber. For the past several years, the local team here at J.P. Morgan Chase has been a foundation sponsor of the Chamber. Their support allows us to host events like this and continue our many initiatives for you and the business community. Now, some ground rules for today's event. Our presenters will take us through a slide presentation packed with information and insight into today's topic, which will take about an hour, and after that, we'll devote 30 minutes to Q&A. However, if you have questions during the presentation, please enter them into the chat box below, which the presenters and I will be monitoring. Please do keep your microphones muted during the presentation. Today's presentation will be recorded and made available on the Chamber's YouTube channel immediately following today's event. Now, I'm very proud to introduce today's presenters. Carolyn DeVar is the Executive Director, Head of Identity and Access Management and Data Management, Protection and Privacy for Commercial Bank at J.P. Morgan Chase & Company. Carolyn has 20 plus years of experience in the technology and financial services industry. In her role, she has responsibility for security administration, privileged access, end user access, control oversight and governance, access strategy and data management, privacy, protection and controls. As a subject matter expert, she's given this presentation dozens of times this month as the topic is vitally important given the current working situations for millions of Americans. Tony Perkins is a shareholder and co-chair of the Technology, Outsourcing, and Data Security Practice Group. Tony has practiced law with Bernstein Schur for three decades, and since the late 1990s, has assisted countless startup and established technology companies. He manages Bernstein's business advisory division, helping new and growing companies to assist with equity, growth, and strategic alliances like this. Carolyn and Tony, take it away. Thank you and welcome everybody. Um, what we're gonna do today is we're really gonna look at this from two perspectives, not only from data, but also from what are your cyber um, impacts and what is the fraud loss that comes from that? So if we move into um, the first slide that we're gonna talk about, it's really like, what are we seeing when we talk about the changing landscape? So one of the big things that we always um, base ourselves on is look, we look at NIST, so the National Institute of Standards and Technology around the cybersecurity domain. And they have something called the CIA triad that stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Think about if you had an exposure and your pricing list got out, your client list got out, maybe it's you, you know, if you're in healthcare, your patient files got out. How do you protect that confidential information? Then we think about it from an integrity perspective especially from a financial services perspective, if we take a transaction, our job is to move that transaction from point A to point B exactly as it was instructed, not adding an additional zero or taking an additional zero away. And then lastly, we have the availability. This component is really that disruption. Think of if you have a distributed denial of service attack. What is the ability for your company to continue operating if your online presence is down? We're seeing a large growth in business email compromise. We'll dive into that a little bit more uh, later in the presentation and ransomware attacks. But before that, I want to hand it over to Tony for a few minutes to really talk about what is happening in our regulatory environment that is trying to protect a lot of this information, yet we're still seeing some of these attacks. So, Tony? Thanks, Carolyn. Good morning, everyone. Uh, what you'll see on the screen is an uh, overview of some of the laws that are out there, and it really is a patchwork. Uh, quilt of laws. There is no overarching federal law right now, and that is something that um, it, it'll be interesting to see whether the incoming administration in Washington wants to try to act, because currently uh, each state in the United States has its own data breach laws, and they're all different. 
they have different timelines, they have different requirements on reporting. And so it can make for a pretty challenging uh, environment if you do uh, have a suspected data breach event and you're asked to um, notify three dozen different states uh, and regulators in those states. And we have experienced that and it, it is a large challenge. We'll talk about how we might address those things uh, later in the presentation. Right now, uh, you're seeing California take the lead um, in moving beyond just data breach. Uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act and a recent uh, addition to that act through a, uh, it's called Proposition 24, which would actually heighten some of the requirements and give citizens in California, residents of California more uh, power over their data. It is just heightening um, the need to track these uh, laws and determine what you need to do proactively, um, both from a uh, technical and administrative standpoint, which we'll talk more about, but also legally, uh, because the fines and penalties can be quite significant if, you're, uh, if you fail to comply and you are subject to, for instance, the California uh, Consumer Privacy Act. Uh, closer to home, Massachusetts also has a uh, significant proactive statute there. The data, regulate, data security regulations in Massachusetts do require proactive steps, which we'll talk about um, in a little bit, uh, to protect that uh, customer data, also your empl employee data. Uh, so what are they really looking to cover? Uh, the overarching goal really is to protect individuals uh, from identity theft, financial fraud, and other uh, similar harms. And they're trying to protect uh, name, social security number, driver's license, any number or combination of the items that you see on the screen, uh, which would give someone essentially your identity. And it could be for bank fraud. It could be for health insurance fraud, um, credit cards uh, are opened in your name, et cetera. So we've all seen those things happening. Uh, and it seems like it's now, if not a weekly, a daily uh, event where you see some breach. Uh, and these, and Carolyn's gonna talk to you a little bit about what's happened in the COVID era, but suffice it to say, this is not going away. It's gonna stay with us. Uh, and uh, ultimately you'll see, I think you will see things in the United States that are similar to what you're seeing in Canada and over in the European Union where they have very aggressive uh, very protective statutes uh, protecting individual consumers' uh, private private information. Carolyn, I, I I think we can uh, we can jump back. Yeah, them, I think I've covered that uh, that next slide. So let's talk about COVID. Yeah. So um, COVID, the you know the March surprise that a lot of us weren't expecting, and all of a sudden having to move, you know, our companies to a work from home strategy. Many of us probably have have business resiliency plans where maybe if one of our sites goes down or if our online presence isn't there, how do we operate? But this one was a little different. People now, instead of having to say, I had site one and site two can take over and people were trained and ready to go, we all went home. We went to a completely untested environment. While many companies had flexible work arrangements where you could work from home, it wasn't a permanence of your 90, 95, 100% of your workforce. So in the early days when we saw the increase to the FBI, which is one of the main um, organizations where you report cybercrime to, we saw an increase of over 250% of complaints. And correlated to that, we also saw um, losses of over $15 million. Now, what was really causing that is some of the things that we saw were very early on social engineering attacks. Everybody wanted to know how close was COVID, this new disease, this new illness to, to home. And so they wanted to, we saw a lot of impersonation of like the global health organizations. The problem with that is either you were getting an email and maybe you were donating, but really you were donating to a fraudulent organization so that money wasn't going to where you thought it was going. Or more importantly, we were seeing malicious links that were downloading malware, so malicious software onto your devices. This was then starting to do things like screen scraping and key logging to really figure out what are those credentials to then use to attack you to get money, or in some cases to get your data to then get money. 
We also saw a lot of themes where these trend, these pandemic apps, so not only the websites, but also the apps that people were installing onto their phones, which were now their primary communication mechanism. And you were seeing a lot of compromise in those spaces as well. We saw credentials being compromised because not all organizations had multi-factor authentication on how people were being able to trans, you know, connect into work. We saw this specifically in the email space in which we saw a lot of business email compromise because people actually got in and started creating like forwarding rules. So imagine your vendor is sending you an email that to tell you on what you, how you have to change your particular routing information, but then someone gets it and changes it yet again. And the person that you normally call for your best practice isn't sitting in their office. So you have to trust a cell phone number. Do you trust the number that's provided in an email or do you have that backup number? And those were some of the early things we saw. We also saw a lot of remote vulnerability issues um, just in how people were connecting, were their routers safe? We saw issues early on that people wanted to, who hadn't printed in years, all of a sudden needed the print capability. And we really questioned why, because if we think about how they were being connected that wasn't necessarily safe. And for those of us in the cyberspace, we couldn't monitor that activity once it left and it went to that printing device. And then also, it was also the physical patient. Who were you co-located with that was listening? Did you work, do you, does your spouse, does your roommate potentially work for a competitor? And they inadvertently heard something, potentially misinterpreted it. So if we go back on page four, there are two key links there that we want to make sure everybody sees. And one is the FTC has a site where you can go to really see the latest information on scams. And then there's also an ability to sign up for alerts so that you can be proactive in what the information you're receiving. So if we look here on page five, um, page five is really good in the sense of what we're talking about is industry. So it's not just JP Morgan. It is not just the legal side of the house or what we're looking in is an annual AFP survey that we do in partnership with the FBI. And if you look at the top left-hand corner, the total losses from a cyber crime. So think of it as a business email compromise. You've been fished. You have some type of malware was increasing over $800 million between 2018 and 2019. If we go clockwise and we look at the percentage of companies who had fraud attacks, that was 81%. Now, not all of them had a loss, but it was 81% of the companies reported that they did have some type of an impact. If we go to the bottom right, we can see that between 2018 and 2019, there was an increase in about 115,000 complaints. Now, we just talked about a 250% increase because of COVID. So it'll be really interesting to see what next year's survey brings us in the number of complaints. Now, there is some good news on this slide, and that is at the bottom left-hand corner. If we look at the business email compromise, we went down for the first time by 5% between 2018 and 2019. Now, I'm going to be curious to see how that looks in 2020, given that think about some of the best practices that we have in place to protect our data, to protect our money. It's the callback. Who do we call now? It is that the idea of co-location, that swivel chairing where you can just ask your colleague a question. Some of those items are a little more difficult in this new environment that we operate in. If we move on to slide six, these are some of the popular vectors that we see that are really the forms of an attack. Email remind, remains pretty much number one in the sense that think about how many emails you get on a daily basis. They all have links in them. And sometimes you're curious or you don't even realize you've clicked the link. Imagine when you're on your phone and you're just scrolling how easy it is to click on something and not realize that's the, the item that you clicked on. How many of you have ever gotten a link that you've clicked on and nothing happened? It opened to a dead site. And then a couple months later, you start seeing some fraud in your account. There is a correlation to the two of those because normally what happens in that situation is malware or malicious software has been downloaded that's doing that screen scraping, that key logging, looking at the data, looking at the behavior of your communication styles so they can later be used against you. We've talked slightly about networks. Um, this is where they, they basically wanna come in and do a denial of service. They wanna take down your online presence. Imagine how many of us are now dependent on that online presence to be able to run our businesses. The web, a lot of what we see here are spoofed websites. So JP Morgan has an M in it. It is very easy to make a JP Morgan 
N-N-O-R-G-A-N. Because most of us don't go looking for that M versus two Ns because closely placed, it could look like an M. One thing that we do at JP Morgan is we do scan the dark web. It's not something that you're going to use your normal like Safari browser for. And we look for lookalike domains. And then we automatically give our client service agents a ticket so that they can call the client to notify them so that they can start working on getting that fixed. And the reason that's so important, imagine a blast email goes out to multiple people and it says your JP Morgan account is compromised. Now anyone who doesn't have a JP Morgan account is going to ignore that email and delete it. But for anyone who does, they might go and click on that link. What they're not doing is hovering over the link to see that it is a bunch of randomized characters. It is not going to jpmorgan.com or chase.com. And then they get to a website and it looks just like ours because our, our sites are public. They can be mimicked. They type in their credentials and they know for sure those are their credentials because sadly many people still keep that post-it note on the bottom of their keyboard with that login and that password. And then they get an error and then they try again and they're like, I know I was in this site yesterday. And then they get that dreaded, your account's going to be locked. You need to call to get it unlocked. So instead, they choose to do the forget password option, and they're presented with some vetting questions. The perpetrators have your answers, or at least they assume they have your answers. And the reason they assume that is because you are social engineered. We give so much information away on a daily basis, yet as Tony just talked about, we spend so much time trying to come up with policies and regulations and laws to protect the very thing we give away. Imagine what you put on social engineering. You go on Facebook and you post pictures that you're about to get on a plane or that you're on vacation. Personally, think about the exposures that you have at home. You put your full birthday. You mark that the individual that you are connected with is your mother, mother's maiden name. Now, a lot of times what will happen is these vetting questions will be presented and say like, what's your favorite vacation destination? Now, if you've just been to St. Lucia or Mexico or the Virgin Islands or wherever, when we get to start traveling again, someone might select beach. And it's right, at least you feel that it's right. They feel that it's right, it lets you in. And now they ask you to change your password, but they're kind enough to let you use that exact same password. They don't make you make it complicated because they want your password. And then that next link that you go into clearly is not the JP Morgan site. And by the time you go to your account, your money's gone. And this compromise is one that we have seen many times from a social engineering perspective. We also talk about mobile. Um, mobile, in, the big thing here is public Wi-Fi, free is not free. You don't know who is watching you on that connection and what information you're transmitting. Think about something, something simple as a virtual private network. You can put a VPN onto your phone. Many of us forget that our phones are no different than our iPads, our tablets, our laptops, our computers. From a landscape perspective, they're you know, a bit smaller, but think about all the things that you can do on your phone. You need to protect it in the same ways. The last thing we're gonna cover from the vectors is physical, and that really relates to USB devices. So imagine you've gone to a conference and you've picked up one of these USB devices so that you can store extra data and it's easier to take data home now I beg the question of why are we allowing our employees to take data home? If we have the ability to remote in, there is no need for an employee to send email to a personal email address or to take data off site. We locked this down a while ago because USB devices can actually take over the operating system of your device and start transmitting that very data you're trying to keep safe. So one of the big things here, we saw about an 80% reduction when we locked that part of the environment down and also prevented people from sending emails home. Now, the majority of employees are not malicious. They're not trying to take your data. The problem is what email address are they sending it to and how safe is it? We've all seen the breaches of the popular free browser softwares like the Googles, the Hotmails, the Yahoos. Sadly, there are studies that show that the people that changed their password are in the 20s to 30%. So do you really want your data going to an account where someone hasn't protected that? 
if we continue on, we're going to now dive into some of the various approaches that we see being used. On page seven, this one is all about business email compromise. So in business email compromise, you are willingly taking an action that is being directed in an email. Sometimes you'll be divulging sensitive company information. Majority of the time what we see here is the initiation of a payment, really that change to those routing, that routing information in order to make that payment. One of the stories that I always like to tell is that we had a service agent who kept getting an email that they wanted to change the account from a three to an eight in this one, in this one placement. And she knew that that numbering convention wasn't part of our routing number, yet they continued to do that. And when we dove into it, we realized that the client, they actually had a compromise on the actual employee's account. And that is something that we consider something like an account takeover. Another thing that we see a lot of is the email spoofing where the header might be. So for example, Jamie Dimon, our CEO and president, you will see something as they will take one of his M's and make it two N's. Now, if that's sent to one of our service agents, that looks urgent. Jamie, our CEO, needs help. What we always try and train our agents is the logic, the connection there, in the sense of, would Jamie really be the person that would be sending you an email to work on a client's account and routing information? They try and take the behavior aspect of it, the sense of urgency of where that is coming from. We see the same thing in the business partner email compromise here where it is not, are they impersonating one of your employees? They're impersonating one of your vendor's employees and then coming to you for that question. We've already talked about lookalike domains where they're really trying to create a secondary domain that looks like your domain that to trick people to come in and place that payment. Again, a fraudulent transaction. If we move on, um, page eight, we'll quickly look at it. This is an example of what a business email compromise can look like. We've um, redacted some of the information to really call it out because majority of the time, you're not gonna go look at that domain name and see that there's an extra R in contract, for example. There's always a sense of urgency around these. They want you to update or change something. And then they give you a phone number to call. That phone number, is not going to be the phone number that you are really should be using. Think about going into like your client master or your contact master and making sure that number is there. A best practice we always try and explain to people is at the point in time when you set up a relationship with a new vendor or a bank, for example, have the conversation there of how they're going to communicate change to you. Are they going to do it via an email? Are they going to do it via mail? How is that process handled and what is that validation? Train your employees to be empowered, to push back when they see something that is suspicious and have those escalation procedures in place. Don't wait until after something like this has occurred because every single one of these sessions that we have, sadly, it's all the hands that go up that they've seen one of these emails. And especially now that we're in the holiday season, you know, I know I've, as of right now, I probably will have about $100,000 in free um, coupons from all of the different vendors. Last night, I got one for $1,000. Think about all of these different links. Think about your family and friends who might click on those and be giving away information or thinking that they're donating to a cause. If we continue on, the next one that we're going to talk about is phishing. So we're business email compromise, you are taking an action in the sense of divulging information or you are taking the action of changing the account number. Phishing is slightly different. Here it is more about clicking a link and getting some kind of infection or installation of malicious software, which that software then will track you to be able to give that information away. So what we're gonna go is we're gonna flip over to page 10 and here's an example of what one of these phishing emails will look like. They'll come from a very vague or generic type email address, um, accounts receivable. Think of that as somebody coming from your sender. Is that something you're expecting? Then look at the email address itself, accounts at accountstatus.com. Is that a domain name you normally work with? The orange bar is a best practice in the sense that you can, within many of these enterprise email systems, turn on a flag that when it comes from outside one of your registered domains, it helps your user to be alerted that this is not an internal email. So let's say that accounts receivable is an email address that you use internally. The 
the red flag here should be that combination with the red bar. You'll also notice it has, again, that urgent authoritative type language. They really need a quick response because you have an invoice that is past due. But then when you click on that PDF, it views it as a link. One other best practice that we have internally and that we always recommend to our clients is being able to have a central group to report suspicious emails to. Because imagine if one person clicked on it, imagine if 10, 100. Being able to pull that email back centrally is one of the things that your technology teams can definitely do. If we move on to page 11, we're gonna talk about ransomware. So ransomware is um, something that is definitely becoming more prevalent in the environment right now, and it is all about a criminal taking and encrypting your data and holding it for ransom. One of the things we are also seeing now is something called double tap, where they are not only taking your data, rendering your systems, your servers, your computers useless, they're also starting to use it against you in order to get you to pay. So now the FBI does recommends that you do not pay. The question really becomes up to each individual organization. If we look at 2019 alone, there were over 2,000 complaints that had about 8.9 million in adjusted losses. So that's a quite a large number. So how can you make your organization resilient? One of the first things we always focus on is that business impact analysis or that BIA. Do you know if you're attacked, where you could handle some disruption from a resiliency perspective? Do you have that business resiliency plan? Are your employees trained? Can they take over that other function if they need to? Now, to build out that plan, you first need to figure out what are your critical systems? How are they connected? How is your network set up? Do you have a very flat network? If you get into one system, it can easily hop to the next system. Think about that interdependency. And if that critical system goes down, how else can you operate? Now develop a plan and make sure that that plan isn't just technology or risk or compliance delivering it. It has to be with the business partners because when it comes to the execution and the actual incident response, your business might be the one who's there. What are the regulations that you have to comply with? What are your reporting standards? Many of the countries that we operate in, it's within 24 hours that you have to give that notice. And what does that notice include? Will you be prepared? It's great that you have all the planning in place, but if you don't test and exercise it, imagine the chaos you're going to have. Now imagine that you had a ransomware and you can't get to the server where that plan is stored. Test and exercise, we do these multiple times. They're called tabletops in one form where you literally sit at a table with all the paperwork and you simulate the exercise. It's great to see, especially in these changing environments where we might be able to take a step out or maybe we missed a step, but do it at a time of peace versus chaos to really make sure not only that you have the plan in place, but that those that you depend on to execute the plan know their part. There was a company in Europe last year that lost $40 million in day one when they were taken ransom. They had a pristine plan, but they didn't know how to execute it because they had never tested it and the authors were no longer there. So think about that. If you're gonna make the investment, make sure you also do the investment in continuous awareness and continuous education of those involved. Now on page 12, we're just gonna give you a snapshot of, this is an actual example, it has been de-identified, of what a ransomware notice could look like. The key thing we wanna call out here is the Bitcoin. This is not where the bank is going to be able to wire funds on your behalf. You are going to need some type of a cryptocurrency account. Now, the question we get a lot of times is, do I need to go open a, an account right now? Th that might not be the case. A lot of times you can work with your cyber insurance, and we'll talk about cyber insurance in a little bit, and they can help you make these payments. But think about that as you develop this incident response plan, that business resiliency, that impact analysis. Would you even pay? Are you even allowed to pay? And then who makes the call to make that payment? And then lastly, how? Some of the best practices you can see here on the page is also make sure you're doing backups. And make sure you understand that your backup inventory is safe. I uh, recently was on one of these and one of the individuals on the call noticed that their backups had been missing, random backups had been missing. When they, and they figured this out after they had had a ransomware attack. And so it begs the question of, if I get a ransom attack today, how will I look tomorrow? 
So if we move on to the next slide, this is an example that correlates to that page on the prior. And what we can see here, it was three different malware, the little red bugs, over the course of multiple months. So now it makes that question of, am I going to pay even more complicated? Because which backup do I go to? And can I afford to lose that much information from the point in time, let's say in this case, they have to go to the backup from January 9th. Can they really afford to lose multiple months of data? These are the questions that you need to figure out as you're building that assessment. In this case, 11,000 servers and computers were locked and it all started with a phishing email where an end user clicked on a link. A best practice that we always recommend is think about why do your individual users need admin rights to their machine to be able to download and install software? Because that's what happened in this case. So I'm going to hand it over to Tony on the next one. So when you have that breach, what do you do? Thanks, Carolyn. So these days you're seeing a lot of ransomware attacks. And one of the things that I want to talk about uh, right up front is the determination of actually what has happened. Uh, the, the statutes, as I'll talk about, the statutes deal with these cyber attacks or cybersecurity events in, in slightly different ways. And on our, in our experience, uh, what we've had trouble with or what the IT professionals have had trouble with is determining whether a ransom attack is truly a ransomware attack seeking to hold your data hostage and then be paid in Bitcoin usually. Um, or is it a, a cover, uh, sort of a Trojan horse attack, so that they actually are inside your system and they are removing uh, data? And it's important for purposes of the statutes that you determine whether that's the case. And, and the reason that I say that, let's use Maine, for example. The data breach statute in Maine, hinge, your actions hinge on whether you reasonably determine that that data is going to be used to harm an individual, that that personal information that again is listed there could be used to harm an individual. At that point, based upon that determination, and also often the case, the number of folks who have been um, implicated in, in the, the attack, say it's a large data server um, that holds all of your customer records, all of their payment records, et cetera, that is going to trigger a particular type of action. If it's a smaller server, it's a subset of the data, you, you need to look at the statutes that might be implicated to determine what you need to do. But the first thing that you need to do is determine what have we got going on here. Um, one of the things that we get asked is, you know, do you want to talk to our IT director? We're going to go do these things. Um, what I would suggest in every situation is assemble an appropriate team of responders, and that includes an outside IT professional. And the reason that I say that is, uh, A, from a legal standpoint, you're trying to preserve evidence. I can tell you that in the last four or five data breach situations that we've handled, internal IT team members have attempted to determine what's gone on. They have harmed the, the, uh, the web logs that are there within your, your, uh, uh, your, your uh, router, and you can't determine whether anything has gone in or out. So do you have just a ransomware attack or do you have information leaving the premises, if you will, so that you are then into the reporting requirements under the statute? So we always recommend, always recommend that an outside IT professional, you know, forensic IT folks, come in and assist. They're used to dealing with the chain of custody. They, they have a very, um, you know, very rigid, uh, I don't want to say rigid, but they're, they're very disciplined in about how they go about examining what has happened. Your IT uh, professionals need to be there uh, riding shots, shotguns, so to speak, because they should have an idea of where data is, is held, how it's backed up. Caroline talked about that. Uh, one, of the, one of the big issues that we've seen is, and this is usually with smaller mid-sized companies uh, because they don't have the staff internally, but they don't know where the data is sitting. They don't know where those backups are. And so the, 
the, the very need to track that um, relies on having good internal records, understanding where your outside providers are storing data. If you're doing backup, real-time backup, every other day backup, what, where is it? Who holds it? Is it connected to your system in a way that if your, your internal network is compromised, can they easily port over to your backup? All of those things need to be examined right out of the gate. Um, your attorney, whether an in-house counsel or an outside counsel who's experienced and understands the sequence of events ought to be involved. And then you need your C-level uh, management folks involved. Uh, at, a, at a company the size of JP Morgan, um, I'm not sure that Jamie Dimon's gonna get involved, but there's gonna be a tier of executives that, who are gonna be on that response team. For more mid-market companies like you'll see in Maine, Northern New England, it usually goes right up to the CEO um, and the CTO certainly, and if you don't have one, you've got an outside uh, outsourced IT professional who acts as your CTO. All of those folks need to be part of your response team. Uh, involve your inter attorney as well, and not to try to you know, make work for attorneys, uh, but there are reasons why you have your attorney involved, A, to look at the statutes, B, there's an attorney-client privilege. So if things have been done that are could be harmful to your case, if you were ever if this ever came out in a court or in an arbitration or re regulatory proceeding, you want to be able to rely on that attorney-client privilege to determine the steps um, from the initial breach assessment all the way through uh, remediation steps that may take place. And so there are some very specific legal reasons why you want to protect that information. Um, oftentimes, our firm will retain the IT professional um, and so that their work product as they do the assessment is also subject to that attorney-client privilege, uh, at least for the time being. If ultimately they bring it out to the court or the regulatory body, then that, that privilege goes away. But in the first instance, being able to keep that confidential is, is very, very important. Uh, and as you can tell, a lot of moving parts there. So going back to Caroline's comments, you need a plan. You need a data breach reaction plan, a response plan, and you should do the tabletop exercises. Each one of these different types of attacks, whether it's ransomware, actual breach, phishing, can have different results, can lead you down a different path, and you need to be able to check your way down through your assessment plan, your, your response plan, because it may require different actions. If it's truly ransomware, you don't have a breach uh, that may require notification under these breach notification notification statutes, which are the primary uh, statutory uh, uh, tools that most states have. Uh, if you're in California or if you're in Massachusetts, and Caroline, you may know uh, there are other states now that are doing preventative, you know, proactive steps to secure systems, hard drives, mobile devices. But Massachusetts is sort of our, has been our standard for a long time. Uh, much like HIPAA, there are things you need to do. If you use certain types of devices, storage devices, networked backup, there are actions that you need to take to encrypt um, and protect that data, whether at rest in storage or in transit. And so understanding all of those aspects of your system are going to be important to having a real good assessment plan. Question that's listed there, um, paper or electronic? Please remember, yes, we get really focused on electronic records these days because most everyone does this digitally. But this information also exists in paper form. Um, Many of us have accounting departments where there are financial records and information and bills and routing numbers, et cetera, that may be on paper. You also need to do a physical assessment of your, your office, um, your records retention center, et cetera, to make sure that there are, are appropriate uh, technical and administrative protections in place to protect those paper records as well. The, the, the sticky on the bottom of your computer or on your computer screen um, 
you know, those existed in our office not too long ago. Now you're not gonna see one anywhere because we continue to do that, that training. Um, again, as I mentioned in the outset, um, the, uh, the type of information lost, assessing that, um, you need to know whether those elements are together so that you have the type of data at risk that would require you to um, engage in a, a notification, both to the, to the customer or employee group, also to the regulatory agencies who may oversee your particular industry and may require you to notify them so that they can get involved and try to protect um, the, the parties whose data has been uh, misappropriated. We could go to the next, the next slide real, real quickly. It's post-breach. So you've got really the post-breach is about, all right, we've made the legal assessment, the likelihood of misuse or harm. Where do we go now? That's gonna be done very quickly. Many of the statutes that uh, you see now are down to a matter of days. There are some exceptions um, as to if there's a police investigation, you get law enforcement involved, they may give you more time until there is a required notification. But some, and Vermont is one, really short, no real exceptions, you need to start giving notice. We had a situation a few years ago, a small accounting firm based in Portland, Maine, and there was a break in. Someone took a bunch of electronics, including a small computer that was their server. It was not encrypted. It had all of the data about their clients. And there were probably close to two dozen states, uh, two, uh, residents from two dozen different states implicated. That was a situation where they didn't know whether this particular party who broke in um, was going to try to get into the computer. Um, it seemed like it was petty thieves that had come in. There was some some vandalism in the office as well as some of the electronics taken. Uh, the burden on that accounting firm uh, financially, administratively to make those kinds of notifications to the customers or clients in, in close to two dozen states, potentially to regulatory authorities in almost as many states, when they weren't really sure what they had in front of them, they ultimately decided that they were not gonna do notification. They said, if we give notice on, under these circumstances, our business is probably over. We're a trusted advisor, it's, it's gonna be harmful to us. And you know, we gave them the, we laid it out for them as to what could happen later on, but they made that determination. And uh, thankfully, nothing ever came back on it. I think it actually probably was Vandals, they wouldn't have known how to access that hard drive or known what they had had they got in there in the first place. So knowing that is, is important. The next step, um, once you know, uh, is to make a notice of claim to your insurer. I'm going to talk a little bit about and a little bit about cyber liability insurance, which is much more available, much more, much more cost effective than it used to be. But you need to then go to your policy and determine what are the triggers for making a notice of claim? Because there are some really nice features in these policies, but again, if you get too far down the road or take steps that are inconsistent with the requirements of your policy, you may not get the coverage that you were paying for. So make that step. Again, have your counsel involved, your C-level executives involved, and, and be sure that you're timely with that particular claim. Many, and I will say, it used to be that the insurers were not as involved as early on as they are today. I think they've begun to, there was no standardized form, by the way. This isn't like getting um, general comprehensive, you know, uh, casualty and, and liability insurance. These are often endorsements or separate uh, policies, uh, standalone policies. But uh, what we've seen in the very recent past is that they wanna be involved early. They've got experts available to them. They want to help mitigate the harm so that their exposure as the insurer and the payment of claims is much lower. So they've got some steps that they want to uh, have you undertake and, and they'll bring in uh, experts if you don't have them. So have that conversation early, coordinating your response and your post breach activities with your insurer is really important to maintain that coverage. Um, 
I mentioned, you know, you have to do notice. And it really is, you know, you almost have a, um, a Gantt chart with different states and the requirements. Uh, in that situation that I described with the accounting firm, we had mapped it out on a spreadsheet to determine when and what you can say. The letters that you send out, some states require you to tell what happened in some detail. Others don't want you to say what happened in any detail for fear that it would compromise a criminal investigation and or that, and I've heard this and I don't know if it's true, that there would be copycats um, if folks got their hands on those letters, if the press got their hands on a letter, um, hey, that, that worked. Somebody was able to pull it off by doing X, Y, or Z. Most of the statutes I think are being modified to bring a sort of a middle ground. You don't have to get into detail. You need to tell them what has happened. You need to tell them what you are going to do uh, to protect them. And often credit monitoring is one of those things. Um, you advise on changing passwords. Again, depending on the setting that you're dealing with, uh, there are things that the notification will require you to do. Uh, I alluded before to notice to administrative or regulatory agencies in your industry. Again, if you're in a financial, if you're in, if you're in insurance, if you're a uh, broker deal or securities industry, there are very specific things um, that those regulatory bodies are going to require you to do because of the sensitivity, the potential financial harm involved. And so be, be aware of what your particular industry might require. Um, there's a PR aspect to this as well. I'm always surprised when you hear six months or eight months after the fact that there's been a major data breach at a, at a major retailer. We've even had a local financial institution, not JP Morgan, but another financial institution that lost backup drives uh, that allegedly were not encrypted. Um, mind boggling to me. It didn't come out for six or eight months. I mean, no notices, no filings with regulatory agencies. And I, I'm not sure what ever happened, whether there was any you know, class action type suit brought, but that one always puzzled me. Um, it's probably better to get out in front of this and, to, and I'd be interested in Carolyn's perspective on this based on the, on the banking side of things. But our, our considerations for the types of organizations we've dealt with, whether it be we've had municipalities, we've had colleges, we've had accounting firms, small banks, each one of them has a particular relationship with their constituency, but almost in every situation, uh, the, the C-level folks would say, we need to get out in front of this. Mm -hmm. If I'm required to make this notification, I want them to hear it from me, even if it, I'm not sure that I need to make the notification. I think giving notice, allowing people to protect themselves, taking advantage of the insurance that you have available is sort of the, I consider it to be the best practice. Um, and the final thing I'll say on the post-breach activities, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the things you can do is evaluate your security program, your insurance, you know, do a post-mortem, just like they, you know, just like physicians do. How did this case get to where it was? How did it get handled? Where are the weaknesses? And then take reasonable steps to strengthen or improve each of those elements that make up the the framework of your data protection uh, plan. And, you know, again, insurance, service providers, we'll talk a little bit about contracting, the technology you have, certainly the training that Carolyn has alluded to, um, but do that and, and commit to making those improvements because the, the rate of attack is just increasing. And I can tell you that our firm, we haven't had any events that, that have risen to breach, but our IT director can tell you, here's an attack, we can watch our, our um, firewall and tell you who's trying to ping us and get in. I mean, it's, it's constant, it's constant. Um, and so it's not a matter of if, it's when. And so you wanna continually improve, continual process improvement and improving and strengthening those elements of your data protection framework. Carolyn, back to you. Thanks, Tony. And I think one of the things that I want to, what I heard you say is, it's not just the transmitting the data or encrypting the data. Think about where you're storing that data. In that case, it was a single laptop. But we're seeing a lot of questions right now with clients is around cloud. 
not every country, not every state, not every type of data can be put into the cloud. And think about how you're working with third parties. How is your third party protecting your data? Are they keeping up with the same standards? Like a lot of these requirements and a lot of these acts that we're seeing like in Europe, GDPR, here CCPA, in Brazil, we're seeing the new LG, LP, LP, GD. And what we're seeing with a lot of these is that you have to, as a company, be able to prove that fit for purpose, that you use the data in the way that they expected you to use the data, and that you have the right to be forgotten once the regulatory requirement to keep that data is gone. And you have to prove those types of things. So think about not only how would you do that, but think about how would your third party that you're contracting do it? And who's that third party's third party? You might be buying a service, but then they might be having a cloud provider behind that. So really have to look at that full due diligence. And then depending on the confidentiality of the data, how often do you look at it? Like there's many of these that we assess very periodically to make sure that they're continuing to comply with the agreements that we put in place at the onset. I think another thing we also have to think about is how long do we retain data? Everybody wants to keep data forever and ever for that you know, that if, that when I need it. But there are very strict retention standards that are out in the environment based on different industries. And the one thing that I always become very unpopular with is email. Email is not a document management system. It is a messaging tool. Think about how much email you really want to get and keep in an email. Like, do you really want to have someone retain data for 10 years? Shouldn't it by that point have been put into the appropriate storage solution so it can be purged based on requirements and that it can be retained and it can be used when needed in the appropriate way? Because not everyone's going to go looking at your email. Think about what's in your email. And if you think about how many of these different compromises we talked that started in an email, imagine if someone got into your email and they saw the deals and they saw very sensitive information. Be careful with what you have in there. But to your point, Tony, yeah, we're seeing very similar where a lot of the clients are just really wanting to, as quickly as possible, get the news out that they have a problem and, and understand what they know. Because I think it's one of these things, time is of the essence with all of this, um, especially when you suspect a fraud. Like if you're going to be contacting the bank, the sooner you contact us, the sooner we have the potential to help you and really figure out what's going on. If we look here on this slide, this is all about cyber insurance, which Tony already alluded to. And really the key thing about cyber insurance is really that transference of risk from your company to the insurance company and all the things that they're going to do to help you. Now, the key thing is this is not general liability insurance. This is not because think about how do you evaluate your company? How do you evaluate your potential loss when you don't even know what the vector is that attacked you? Like if you, let's say that you have house insurance or you have car insurance, both of those have a market value. And both of those, in those cases, let's say that you left your pilot light on or you let your pilot light go out or you left your stove on or you, know, you let the tub overflow. In most of those cases, there's no prevention. You did the action and your insurance for the most part is gonna pay, your deductible might go up, but it's not that you had to take an action. You didn't have to create an incident response plan. You didn't have to create a business response plan. You didn't have to do a business assessment. You didn't have to understand what were your critical systems. Do write these plans, test these plans, do the tabletops, have a penetration test where you actually have an independent try and break in and see where your vulnerabilities are, and then subsequently fix those. These types of policies are a little different. They require a control structure, a cyber, like a cyber program in order for you to really be able to proactively protect your data. And then valuating loss. You know, that's the really hard part. What we've tried to show here is like, are you going to lose clients? Are you going to lose trust? Are you going to impact people's lives because they're no longer going to have jobs? Do you now have a loss of intellectual property? And the list goes on. Like, are you going to have regulatory impacts? And those are some of the key things to really think about. And the brokers who sell these plans, they will walk you through this. And as Tony mentioned, they're going to help you. The sooner you bring them in when you have an incident, they can help guide you through it. They are the experts in this. They are the ones that see this because they do need to help protect you, but they're also trying to protect themselves in the sense of they're insuring you. They have that risk. So I know that there's some mitigation tactics that we wanted to talk about as well, Tony, so we can move probably to the next page. I think you're on mute, Tony. 
There you go. Sorry about that. Um, so we kind of went at this in reverse a little bit, um, talking about all the bad things that can happen, breaches, et cetera. So what, what are the risk mitigation tactics? How do we, and we put this at the end because I think it matches up with the things, that, the risks you're seeing, the things that Carolyn has highlighted. Um, so I always think about, you know, four legs to the stool. It's not a three-legged stool, it's four. Um, and you've got technology, which is, it, it, it's, it's, a, a, it's table stakes. And encryption technology is readily available now where it used, didn't used to be. Um, passwords are easy. They're password managers. The biometrics, most laptops that you get now, you know, have, have uh, touch pads, you know, to identify you. Your, most phones are the same. So, so those protective technologies are much more readily available than they used to be. Use them. Please use them. It's easy to deploy. It's not a burden. Yes, the first time you do dual authentication, you're thinking, okay, what are the steps that I need to do? Then it becomes second nature. It really, really does. And if you, if you look at where your most sensitive information, financial, health, et cetera, they're all requiring it. And one of the things that I say about the, the industry and the technology that's available, it becomes an issue for, um, it becomes a negligence issue, I guess to put it in, in, the, in the legal term. You know, that we talked a lot about regulations and statutes, and you may not have violated one of those, but there are good plaintiff's attorneys out there who, if you cause harm to your customers or your, your clients or your employees, there are going to be questions asked about whether you have taken reasonable steps. Um, negligence is about reasonableness. Is it reasonable for you to now have encrypted thumb drives? Sure, they're easy to use. Everybody knows how to use them. Is, is uh, you know, uh, encryption on laptops hard? No. Uh, as it becomes easier, you need to deploy these things and you need to do that as part of your assessment. So the technology is first. Carolyn mentioned technical testing, both internal and external intrusion testing. You should do that regularly. We do it annually and then we do our own work internally. So the annual is with an outside expert. It's an outside team that comes in and, and works with us and does that, that testing. And they, you know, it's their job to keep up on the latest threats and the latest technologies and how they're being deployed by the bad guys. Um, you need a written information security policy. Um, I'm sorry, I had, I had something just jump up on my screen that blocked me out there for a second. Um, uh, the, next thing, the next thing after the, the technical, if we could go back one slide just real quickly. Uh, so you're talking about the technical, the training of employees, that's an operational issue. That needs to be constant. It needs to be constant. We even subscribe to a service now we're of a size where we've got remote workers, not just with COVID, but um, you know, attorneys practice and move all over where we are paying a service to basically test us randomly with different uh, phishing schemes, ransomware potential, and we grade ourselves. You know, every six or eight weeks we are, we are graded and our IT director will put those grades out there. And if there's somebody who's regularly an offender, um, they'll, they'll be given remedial training, but it is, it has got to be a constant because the, we're all moving so fast. We have that, that, uh, flow of emails that, that Carolyn talked about. It's hard if you're trying to juggle all of those things and you just need to be alert. And when it's top of mind, because of the training, it makes it easier. Uh, people are always the, the weakest link. Uh, Contractual protections, Carol alluded to this as well. Understanding where your data is, who's providing your services, whether it's outsourced IT, whether it's cloud storage and backup, um, those all should have 
close review of the contracts. You shouldn't be doing a purchase order um, and just signing off on, on a uh, purchase order to get your backup data stored in the cloud. Uh, you should have a contract. You should allocate responsibilities and liabilities. And as Carolyn said, um, in today's world, uh, statutes like the Massachusetts data regulations, HIPAA certainly with respect to healthcare information, you are required to understand what your vendors are doing. How are they handling your information? What technical uh, security measures have they implemented? What insurance do they have? Um, and I think you're going to see the type of audits that many of us get when we're dealing with large institutions and handling sensitive data. We get them all the time now uh, from banks, insurance companies, and others that we represent. They want to know what you're doing. And the, and the statutes that are out there um, are, are going to continually expand that requirement so that you know what your entire vendor network looks like and what they're doing. And uh, put it into the contract and make sure that you can point to a place where they're not disclaiming the responsibility, they've got sufficient insurance to, to uh, cover a data breach if they are doing data processing and storage for you. So um, that, that, that's just critical. Cloud computing means a lot of things to a lot of different people. And depending on who you are, um, you, may not, you may not be able to negotiate, but you need to understand what you may be putting at risk if you've got to sign the generic consumer version of Amazon you know, web storage or Google you know, uh, Dropbox is the one I guess that, that, that everybody uses. I, I'm underwhelmed and it gives me heartburn to read the, the contracts in terms of use for those kinds of consumer uh, level um, storage um, media and, and services. But as a business, you've got more leverage um, you should ask these questions and you should make sure that they are involved in your contract. Um, and then if we can flip to the, uh, to the next page, 18, um, and then you come back to the insurance. And, and after you've done the technical and the training and the contractual and you've closed that risk window as much as you can, that's when the insurance comes in and tries to give you the safety net that you need for those, for those risks that you're just not going to eliminate. I mean, you could take a lot of those other steps and, the, and, you know, what we always hear from the IT folks is the bad guys are always one step ahead of you. And so because it's now available, because it can be cost effective and tailored to your particular needs, meaning you're not going to, you know, if you're a, a small uh, branding and marketing company, you're not going to re require the same type of insurance that a financial institution is going gonna, is gonna to have to uh, have the, the type of data, the volume of data the interactions that you have, um, the data processing um, elements of your business, they're just different. And so there is um, a, a policy for you and good brokers, and there are some good ones around, uh, they can help you put that coverage into place to cover those last uh, risk um, gaps that just aren't going to be covered uh, by the technical and training and contractual elements of that four-legged stool. So. I'll, I'll leave that there and uh, turn it back to Carol. Thank you, Tony. And on passwords, I think that's one of the big things is think about that complexity of your password. I know a lot of people are always, you know, complaining. They're like, now it's 10 characters. Now it's 12 characters and you need to have a number. You can be creative with certain things like that. Think about where maybe you want to use a pair, you want like a phrase and it has an O, make it a zero. It has an E, make it a three, get your creative in the sense like maybe you have a six in a number, but you want to use the carrot or you want to flip a V and make it the carrot on top of the six. There's various ways to make something that's very easy for you to remember. But think about that password because right now that is one of the key things that we still use in our environment to protect our data. These are some things, um, we're not going to read through all of them. It's really some best practices to take away, um, more is like that tear sheet for you. But think about the email provider you use for your company. I've seen one too many companies who have decided that Gmail or a Popmail or a Yahoo is still the best standard for them. It doesn't come with these things like the spam filtering or the authentication. Think about the best practice we showed you with the orange header that says it's coming from outside of the domain. Well, if Gmail is your domain, what domain is it really coming outside of? It's some of those best practices to be able to protect that. Again, because we do like to use email as a document retention as opposed to just a messaging tool. 
Um, be cautious of your Bluetooth, because again, it is an entry point into your environment. When we're back in the office and even at home, depending on who you live with, think about locking your screen and making sure that those passwords are strong. It comes back to what Tony was alluding to, and that's really this idea of a clean desk policy. Why do we, have, why do we allow ourselves to leave data sitting on our desks when we lock ourselves on our screens? So be really careful on how you have that data out there and what there is. Put it into your code of conduct. Like we have in our code of conduct very tight social media policies and what we're allowed to share and what we're not allowed to share. You know, what our responsibility is as an in individual employee to protect the data. It's not just the data protection groups. We're there to put the tools in place, but it's every single person and how they implement new solutions. You know, be careful on keeping your antivirus software current. Think about that router that you're using at home. Is the password password? Did you change that default router? Did you maybe split the router so that depending on who in your house is attaching to it, your connection? And again, public Wi-Fi is not free. Um, some best practices from the financial institution, which really can be deployed across everything. If we look at page 20 is, do you know who has access to your banking relationships? Do you know who has access to your systems? Should they? From a JP Morgan perspective, we're very diligent in making sure that multiple times a year that we're checking that people have access to what they should, that least privileged concept, only the stuff that you need to be functional. Because humans um, inherently believe if they have access to it, then they're allowed to do it. And software isn't perfect. Like we know that software is always going to have a defect or vulnerability, something that we learn of and that we have to clean up and patch as we evolve the technology that we use. Make sure you don't live on that assumption. Make sure you know who really has access. And if someone switches jobs, do you take the access away and give them the access that they really should have? Or do you just keep adding to that list, to that technical debt? Think about how you set up your limits. Not only your payments limits, but maybe it's internal approval limits. Who has access? Who is reviewing it? And especially now as we get into the holiday season, maybe not everybody who's there who normally does this is there. You have that on behalf of that secondary person who this is an additional item that they have to do in a ready and possibly busy schedule. Make sure you put those protections in place. A lot of tools offer it. And make sure that when you put those multiple approval levels that that new approver understands why and what they're approving. You know, don't have same, multiple people logging in from the same device. There's actually this story that I like to tell. We had a client who many years ago had an incident. And when, when we dug into it and we're working with them, it turned out that their help desk proactively called them to tell them they had a problem and then asked if someone who did a similar part of the role could also log into the device. And they couldn't figure out how they got the maker and the checker passwords. I don't know about you, but most times I don't have a help desk proactively calling me. If they know there's a problem, they probably can also proactively fix it. So think about the logic of those situations. And that goes back to the comment that Tony had made on education. This whole concept of continuous, continuous awareness. You know, the phishing tests. But make sure when you do the phishing tests that you're doing them for the person and the audience. Like you wouldn't give somebody in the legal department, in the client facing department, and in the cyber department the same phishing test. Think about how it's relevant to them. You know, sending, sending somebody in legal a contract that they have to click on that goes to a third party site, that might be a test. If you have your client facing group, it's now that they're going to get something from the client. Now, Client facing is a little bit more difficult because majority of their emails are going to have that orange header on them. So be careful on how you design them to make sure that they're effective and that you don't get that false sense of security. Also, think about from a financial perspective that daily reconciliation. The bank is not going to just randomly deposit money into your account. And what we started seeing is a lot of, in, of these um, infiltrators or these hackers, as you want to call them, when they're testing it, they're depositing money in as opposed to trying to take money out because they're trying to test that credential. You know, think about the vendors again, very early on, I mentioned like when you negotiate with a new vendor, figure out how they're going to communicate to you about a change in the setup or how they're going to confirm that they received that payment or how they're going to confirm that they haven't received that payment. Don't move money solely based on an email. That's that business email compromise concept. And think about, especially now in this era of COVID, how do you do that callback validation? What is the number that you call? Not everybody has call forwarding. And if people are working from home, how do you know that cell is really that individual? 
Also, think about the system of record of where you're storing that information. Do you maybe add some of these additional numbers in, but how again, did you validate them? Think about that person who's sending you that email, validate it, hover over, and all of a sudden you might see that that domain name had that extra R like a contract. And make sure that bill is really bill and they didn't add another L into the front of the name. Start looking at some of these very easy and quick ways to protect ourselves. And don't give information to an unexpected caller. Uh, I think we focus so much on phishing, we forget about the other two, which is smishing, which is a text message. You can very easily get a malicious link and click on that and give away information or install bad software. Think about vishing as the voice where someone actually calls you and they're trying to give information away. We've worked with our employees and we constantly are training our employees that not to give that information away. That critical executive who is sitting on you know, the plane who has to get someone else's number, how'd they find your number to make that phone call? Aren't, they in that, aren't you in that same phone book? Think about that connection and be able to make sure that they're really who they are. There's nothing to say that you can't help them and say, you know what, let me call that individual and have them reach out to you. Is your cell the appropriate number? It's looking at things in a different way. You still can be helpful, but you can also be protective and not giving out that critical data. And think about when the financial institution, so if we, JP Morgan, call you and we say that we see an anomalous payment, how will you react? Will you be there to pay attention to it or are you gonna brush it off and just release it? Think about what that person on the other end is saying. They've seen something that doesn't look right. If we move on to page 21, these are just some of the things we always like to call out. And it's really, again, those anomalous payments. We as the bank are gonna call out things that don't match your behavior pattern. We have um, very advanced threat analytics. We spend a lot of money every year making sure these are continuously enhanced and focused on. We have, you know, think of it as these knocks, these big standard, um, these big centers that are constantly monitoring to protect you and finding these patterns and these threat vectors. Education. It's not a one-time class. It is continuous. It's maybe sending out that weekly blurb of remember to lock your computer or remember to set your on behalf of whatever it is that makes sense for your company. And lastly, develop that response plan. Now we've talked about a lot of different things today. If we go on to page 22, this is our JP Morgan commercial banking insights page. And on here, you can see there's a bunch of different white papers. If you go on there today, it'll look slightly different. Um, we are constantly publishing papers on what we are seeing in the industry. Either it has actually happened to somebody or we're seeing it as a financial industry as a whole. Please use this as a resource to really educate yourself and see different ways that the the infiltrators are you know, advancing to kind of give you that fruit for thought. But before we go into q and I just wanna say thank you for having us today and um, one little homework assignment. Go find out what your role is in the incident response plan so that when it does happen, you realize what your job is. Or ask that question, would we pay? Do we have cyber insurance? Whatever piqued your interest today, please do that follow up because it starts with the conversation, and that's how we end up protecting ourselves. So thank you. Carol and Tony, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, we do have a few questions I want to get into, but uh, again, thank you so much uh, you know, for being resources that we can have at our disposal and for being so, uh, so knowledgeable on this subject. So we're very lucky to have had uh, your presentation. And I'll remind people that this presentation will be recorded and available um, on YouTube following the event. Um, I guess the first question that came in, um, in the event of a ransomware attack or apparent data breach, should our IT director lead our response team? I, I can take that to start and then, um, I, we can't answer that. There's not a industry protocol that says it's one person versus another. That's why you build those plans. And there, ahead of time, you define who it is that is dealing with your particular item. Majority of times, I have not seen it necessarily be tech. It's usually a combination of like your risk, your compliance, your legal, as we had alluded to earlier on. But Tony, what are you seeing in the industry? Yeah, the, certainly IT directors are part of the team, but usually um, there is an attorney, um, CFOs who are risk managers are often given, given that role in smaller companies. Uh, and as companies grow, you're seeing more chief information security officers. I'm, I served that role at our firm, 
And so I work directly with our CEO, in-house risk counsel, our IT director, um, our COO. That's the that's our response team uh, initially. So they don't usually lead it, but they are obviously, as my comments earlier alluded to, they are critical members um, of of that team, and they they need to be ready and they need to have gone through the the tabletop exercises and understand how the the reaction plan is going to be rolled out. Thank you guys. Um, another question that came in, can other states or countries impose sanctions on my company if I have data from one of their residents and we experience a data security event? Carol, I, I can take the, I'll start this, but I'd be really interested because JP Morgan clearly has a global footprint and, yeah. <laughs> and they're, they're going to they're gonna have an answer that's a little different maybe than some of the small and mid-sized companies that, that are here in Northern New England. But the as I'd mentioned earlier, Massachusetts is the closest to home, and many companies here in Maine and New Hampshire do deal with um, uh, do deal with uh, Massachusetts companies and with the data that is protected under those those regulations. I have not yet seen a case where they've tried to reach out um, across the border uh, to to impose penalties, et cetera. But if you have a place of business in in those states, certainly that can happen. Um, with respect to California, um, there are, California has recognized that there are tiers of involvement with their state, uh, the residents of their state. And so they have certain number thresholds, how much money you make off from um, their residents, how many resident records you have in your, in your uh, system. And that tells you whether they, you know, whether you even fall under their statute. But again, reaching across state lines, um, it has not been done yet to my knowledge. I would say the same thing for the European um, Union and the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation. That's about processing data cross border. So large organizations, um, airlines, banks like JB Morgan, what is the data uh, for European citizens that they're dealing with? And then there's some very deep and strict regulations as to what they can do. Those companies often have footprints in those those countries and that's that's how they'll reach out and touch you um, and the last one that i'll mention because they're right here on our border is canada and canada uh, is actually looking at a um, statutory framework beefing it up to be much like what the california consumer protection act is and there will be a question there as to whether there's extra ter extraterritorial reach um, Again, I think it'll be more as if you have a place of business there, um, but you need to be aware and to the extent that you are doing enough business so that there is a flow of goods and a flow of money across borders, you need to be careful and be mindful of what those jurisdictions are imposing upon you. Yeah, and another thing that we've seen is um, the different regulatory bodies, like every country has a different breach reporting standard. There's some countries that we have to notify them, like they're their regulatory agency within 24 hours, even if we don't know the full depth of the breach. The other critical thing is think about where your, comp where your people are located. Just because I work in the US and we have jurisdiction in like Singapore and Hong Kong and Europe and you know, the list goes on, doesn't mean I can touch that data. Some countries require that the data is stored on their soil and it is only administered by people on their soil. And so those are some very critical things you have to understand. Like there are ways where we could say that someone in the US might have to support someone in another country, but there are certain regulations and the regulators need to sign off on that. And it has to be very regulated, um, monitored to make sure we're not just giving that to anybody. And it could be just for a period of time. And so there is no standard that we're seeing in those. It is just, you have to understand what is the data movement and you can't store every, not every country is gonna let you store something in the cloud as well. But you also have to think about that storage mechanism. What are those encryption standards that are being required as you're moving the data and administering that data? We have a lot of small businesses here in Maine and certainly that are active in the chamber. So a couple of these next questions and we just have time for maybe two or three um, are very much related to, to smaller businesses. Uh, the first one, uh, what should I be most concerned about with my staff working remotely? Carolyn, why don't you take that one? Yeah, I would say, um, what's their setup at home? Like, do you know that their connection is safe? What are their 
just general behaviors? Like, are they using their cell phone? Are they, um, who are they co-located with? Are they having a critical conversation? Should they maybe be in another room with a closed door? And then what is their setup? Are they keeping up with their, their systems? If you're relying on them to protect, provide the protection, what is that? What is that minimum standard that you're giving them? And you touched on part of the answer there, but the next question was, I just started a company and have only a few staff members. Where should I start with data protection? I think one of the things is like, think about like, how are you going to communicate? Um, this reminds me of a small client that I dealt with many years ago. It was a startup and they decided they didn't care what their email service was. So one of them was using Gmail, one of them was using Yahoo. They all had various ones. And the way that they lost a very large volume of their um, initiating was because of a breach. Someone got into the CEO's email, which was a public free um, web software and was literally rerouting it. And so they were also tracking it. And when the CFO sent them an email that said he was going to Heathrow for the weekend, because he was gonna spend the weekend in London, Right before he left, because they all go, they all knew exactly when that those flights were. He got an email to wire a set amount of money to this country that they had never operated with, and then lo and behold, by the time he landed in Heathrow, you know, eight hours later, he realized what he had done, and he said, "The Saturday, the bank's not there to help me. The bank's here, 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We're here. We have hotlines for that." And so had he called, there might've been something we could do, but by the time we were informed that next Tuesday, when he came back, there was not much we could do. To, the money had hopped. So the thing there is, I would say is have a good email system or have a process of how you're protecting that and think about what you're communicating in email. You know, what are some, making sure like, what is that, that hardware that you're going to be using? What data do you have? What are the stipulations that you're going to be held to on that data? What do you have to protect and where do you store it? Tommy, if I could add to that, if I could add to that just real quickly, there are some very good outsourced IT companies in mm -hmm. greater Portland and in Maine. They can guide you, you know, do you use Microsoft 365 as, you know, their, their cloud environments a, a bit more secure. Get that guidance, because going back to that reasonableness standard that I talked about uh, before, if something happens, you might fly under the radar and the regulations, but there could be a lawyer for somebody that's been harmed that says you, you didn't even ask anybody. It would have been as easy as signing up for this particular service. Or as Caroline says, you're never going to do wire transfers off from emails. That's just not how we operate. Um, so that you can have some policies when, when those critical decisions and com critical communications are gonna take place is how do we do this? And it doesn't take a lot of, of heavy lifting to do that, but I, I just wanna give a shout out to the IT professionals that are out there. Um, they, can, they can help and they are, there are a number of them that will help small and mid-sized businesses. The email one seems like a, a real smart place to start. Um, last question we have is, uh, I'm a small business owner and I don't have the resources to implement as many fraud protections as I'd like. Which do you feel I might get the most, uh, most out of for the least amount of resources, most bang for the buck? Caroline, do you want to, you want to take that? You see yeah, a lot I mean, of different companies. So. Yeah, I would say it's having some of those best practices in place. Like how quickly are you going to change an account? Are you going to really just take it from an email? Like when do you expect those vendor payments and an email that you've gotten? Were you expecting that? Don't act on every single email, even no matter how urgently it is written. If it doesn't feel right, it probably isn't right. But I would say I would um, lean with Tony. A lot of times the easiest thing to do is get that help from the outside, from the experts. And you might, instead of having to implement all of them, they might offer you a package that implements them for you. So it's almost like outsourcing your IT so that you don't have to focus on having them in-house, but having them where you have you know, the multiple support. I agree. Excellent, we actually had one, one question just, just came through on the chat and it's simple yes or no. Should individuals working from home have a VPN? Yes. I'm, yeah, but I'm going to answer it also. Many times your company should provide it. That, that yes, is that yeah, connection. Is. Yeah, like, well, I have a VPN on my phone for my personal dealings. My company, JP Morgan, also provides me that safe connection in. 
because it is their data that's being protected. My device is just the channel to it. Yeah, I agree very much. It, and again, it's, I had alluded to it earlier, uh, these technologies are much more readily available than they used to be. Um, I, for my home, um, I'm on a Mac and I use uh, Avast, which there are free and then premium versions of, of uh, you know, cyberware, um, uh, software, and then also there's a VPN and they'll do it on your phone as well. So they're out there and I, I agree totally. You should never be doing any business outside of a, outside of a VPN because they're just readily available. Well, Carolyn and Tony, thank you so much again uh, for leading us through this very important conversation. Like the Chamber, J.P. Morgan Chase's local team is committed to helping Mainers and Maine companies not only survive this pandemic, but also thrive in the long term. Uh, please feel free to reach out to them or the Chamber with any questions that you maybe didn't get a chance to ask today or any follow-up questions you might have. Um, you're also going to receive a post-event email with the contact information for their team, some helpful links uh, to related articles and resources, as well as a link to the YouTube video recording of this presentation. Uh, now you can also always stay up to date on all the Chamber's upcoming events by visiting our events page at portlandregion.com and sign up for our weekly events newsletter. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today and have a great day.